Perfect. Webinar's now live. Hello, everybody. We'll just wait a, a minute or so for, for people to join as they, they kind of flood in with all of the registrations that we've had. Perfect. So I think Brooke's kindly sharing our, um, our house rules. I'm sure we're all used to online events by now. Um, but just as a quick bit of housekeeping, really, if you have any te technical difficulties with sound or connection, um, we just suggest leaving the session and rejoining. Um, everyone's going to be on mute just to, to make sure the audio is as best as possible. Um, and to our lovely panellists, if you can just make sure your computer notifications are off, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, the session will be recorded and we'll share the recording after the event uh, for everyone to access. And to our audience, um, please send us your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we'll do our best to respond to as many questions as possible at the end of the discussion. Um, if we are unable to answer all of them, um, we'll be arranging some follow-up offline afterwards. Um, and I think everyone knows, but the session's um, going to be for 60 minutes, including that Q&A session. Fantastic. Well, I think people are joining now. Um, we've done our housekeeping, so I think we can we can dive in. So good morning to everyone in New York and welcome to those based elsewhere. Um, this is our first event as part of our April US tour. And we're here today to talk about fintech. And so we had to start at its recognized home, which is New York. Um, I promise not to use the word unprecedented too much, but it's certainly been a, a really unique time for us all. I think throughout this, fintech has remained front and centre and is playing an important role in businesses recovering and businesses evolving as we move towards what that new normal might be. Um, I'm pleased to say we have a, a really exciting panel of industry experts, fintech ambassadors, and um, enthusiasts who are going to be sharing their insights today and talking about fintech and the um, I'd like to introduce you to our wonderful panelists. So Camilla, over to you first. Yeah, happy to, uh, happy to be here. So Camilla Garcia, I'm the Vice Consul for FinTech and Professional Services with the UK's Department for International Trade. Uh, my role is largely focused on market entry support, including business development and market exposure for UK firms in the US market, <clears throat> and then helping guide US companies throughout their UK investment. I have a focus on everything to do with fintech, although I naturally spend more time on companies that are conducting their business internationally. Fantastic, thank you, Camilla. And now over to you, Seb. Hi, thanks, Adam, thanks for having me. Sebastian van Skolkwijk, I'm the MD for Onbi uh, Europe. I am responsible for the, uh, the build out and the development of the, the EU infrastructure here on the ground. I've uh, been on the ground here for about a year, I've been with Onbi for three years, um, and yeah, glad to be here today. Perfect. And now on to Alexandra. Thanks so much, Adam, and thanks um, for the panelists and Zedra. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, my name is Alexandra George. I am the FinTech Platform Manager at RISE, created by Barclays, and sit within the Barclays Group Innovation Team. So I'm really responsible for managing our New York Innovation Hub and the 50 com FinTech companies that we have in the space, as well as fostering an ecosystem of FinTech startups to bring back to Barclays and its clients. Uh, I've been at the firm for four years and in this role for oh, about two years. Um, and really looking forward to the conversation. So I'll pass it back to you, Adam. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and just to finish introductions off, um, I'm the mod moderator today. Um, my name is Adam Dunnett. Uh, I'm a tax director at Zedra. Um, we're a specialist in active wealth, fund solutions, um, and global expansion. Um, we have offices across the world. And one of our big specialisms is partnering with high growth North American tech companies, many in the FinTech scene, on their overseas operations or when they're taking their first steps into a new market. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're, we're running similar events um, in April as part of our US tour in Denver and also in San Francisco. Um, so be sure to check those out too. Fine, so now that we've done introductions, get to jump into the exciting content. Um, and this question is gonna to go to Camilla. Um, so Camilla, 2020 
and I'm saying this already, was an unprecedented year and the effects of the, the pandemic have been far reaching on a global scale. I think we all agree that fintech didn't end up unscathed, although it ended the year in a strong position. If we take stock of the last 12 months, how do you feel the industry performed? And what is your assessment of its current health? Hey, yeah, so really, when we were having this conversation last year, the dialogue was stay lean, buckle down and ride the wave, right? Companies were advised to extend their runway for the next 12 months, uh, focus on their existing partnerships and really turning on their survival mode switch. Uh, what we ended up seeing is an explosion of mega rounds by later stage fintechs, so the likes of Chime and Robinhood, uh, a push to innovate fueled by fintech and bank partnerships, so the likes of Oak North and PNC, uh, Revolut and Sutan Bank, and also a rapid adoption of digital financial services, e-commerce, payment solutions to cater to the new normal. So the likes of Klarna and Affirm. Uh, there are those that have struggled, right? And those really were pre-revenue and early stage fintechs that reported facing operational and funding challenges during the pandemic. Uh, also, those operating in the lending space, so like on deck, green sale funding circle, really struggled as their customers began to default. What we saw is that companies began to change their business model, start charging for some functionality that were previously free, or having to raise funding from existing investors to really refuel that tank. Uh, several trends were accelerated by COVID-19, like the jump of digitization by three to five years, an increased appetite for consumers to better manage their finances, and the increased pressure for financial institutions to adopt new technologies or risk falling behind. What will be exciting in 2021 will be M&A activity, right? So this time last year, experts were predicting that there's this once in a lifetime opportunity where the implications of unemployment and uncertainty would have really shrunk valuations and spurred acquisitions between FinTech and banks. And this really took an interesting pivot. So in 2020, at FinTech m and reduced by about 50%. And we can really largely attribute this to a decrease in the bank's risk appetite, given the circumstances going on. On the other hand, uh, SMP released an article saying that m and activity will really be driven by big tech companies because they, unlike the banks, have thrived during the pandemic and now have excess capital to spend. So what we've seen is that big tech has been increasingly involved in financial services, and this really is their opportunity to take a competitive edge by acquiring fintech solutions as an additional value add to their service. Thank you, Camilla. Some great comments there. I think it's a, a good assessment of, of where we're at and what's happened over the last 12 months. And I think you referenced M&A activity and some fairly big um, events and, and names there. Um, so just touching on that, that AMA, um, I think Alex, I know you based in New York, you work with a lot of fintechs on a, on a daily basis, just building on um, those kind of investment um, comments. Um, how, how do you see that trend emerging and what are those some of those kind of underlying investment trends that you picked up on recently? Yeah, absolutely. I think in terms of the investment trends, both in terms of funding and then if you're looking at M&A activity, um, it's really been kind of a tale of two stories across the, the pandemic in some ways. So I would say at the beginning of the pandemic, you're really sitting in a place where um, investments skewed more than they slowed down, which I think was contrary to what a lot of people thought when the pandemic hit. And I think this was due to kind of several factors. So the first one was that there wasn't necessarily a clear working model for startups and investors um, to pitch, to fundraise, and to really have those relationships that they had in person. Um, and I think we joke about it now of the FinTech founder pitching in his underwear at home and you're being able to kind of fit more of those meetings in, but that working model at the beginning of the pandemic didn't necessarily exist. And that's where the network effect of VC and fundraising um, really ended up skewing where the funding numbers were going. So for early stage companies, pre-seed to seed, the ones that were really developing their product market fit, but also in a position where they were being forced to pivot, that's where you saw significant declines in origination and increasing delinquencies. 
But on the other side, where you look at pre-existing, so growth stage companies, companies that were already in an investor's pipeline, that's where VC investors really started to double down, making sure that they were giving that advice to kind of put down their battle hatches, as Camila noted, um, and really focus on their pre-existing um, investments. So those companies survived through that kind of um, you know, uncertainty period and really came out on the other side stronger. So that's where you actually ended up seeing significant funding um, for those uh, growth stage companies and even higher valuations um, because of the fact that fintech is really um, a digital offering that benefited and flourished during that time. Um, you know, I think I pulled a, a stat that was saying that private funding into fintechs was 20% higher in 2020 relative to 2019. And that's really because of those growth stage and later stage companies that were able to really develop um, their products and come out in this digital first economy um, stronger. Um, so I think that in terms of funding is what we saw. And then if you're looking at kind of M&A 2021 um, liquidity, I think, you know, a, we're in a low interest rate environment, and so there's, and B, there's a lot of new investment vehicles. I know there's, you know, talk of SPACs, and I don't want to necessarily get into that um, right now, but I think those new investment vehicles and also new asset classes that have been created um, or been enabled due, the, due to the digital economy, I think that's where more investors are starting to put their money in. I don't necessarily consider VC a new investment uh, vehicle, but I think for a lot of investors, it is still a relatively new asset class, and that's where you're starting to see more money going into funds, and then more you know, money from the funds going into startups um, and those higher valuations. Um, and then just on the M&A front, I think there's several trends just really undermining all of M&A activity that have been kind of brought forward by the digital adoption. Um, and I would add to what Camila said about it's financial institutions acquiring fintechs, but it's also fintechs acquiring fintechs and big tech, which is a new player, I, well, relatively new player in the space that's acquiring fintech. Um, and some of those key trends are really diversification of product lines, um, I think reaching you know, SME, small, medium enterprises, and also kind of merchant markets and thinking about um, artists as entrepreneurs and as business owners, for example. Um, I think the open banking trend and looking at like the MasterCard and Finicity agreement and bringing open banking to the U.S. so that, you know, these um, card providers are actually now platform providers and providing these B2B offerings um, is another key trend that, um, you know, you can kind of see across M&A activity right now. Um, and then the last one I touched on is really that digital first offering of blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and alternative assets really coming to the forefront and companies trying to figure out how that fits within the products that they're offering. So I think that's what we're seeing in terms of M&A activity and, and where some of that high valuations are kind of funneling into acquisitions this year. Brilliant. That's a really comprehensive answer on the investment side. Thank you. And I feel we could have a, a whole different session on, on SPAC. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I was like, don't want to get into that one, but um, <laughs> another session. Definitely, yeah. No, we, yeah, we really could. But thank you. So I think between those answers, we've got a, a nice assessment of of the last twelve months. Those key investment trends, those those key developments that are emerging. What's on the horizon, and where the fintech sector is positioned. I think it's now a, a good time to 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 get a perspective from uh, a really successful US fintech. And um, so we'll move on to Seb. So Seb, um, question for yourself. Um, as a US fintech, you expanded globally, perhaps during one of the most challenging years in recent times. Um, I think as managing director of Ombi and having personally led the European expansion, could you tell the audience about the journey and, and how has it been? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, I mean, the journey hasn't been easy. That's for sure, but it's been so worthwhile. Um, our journey actually started a couple of years back before we landed, uh, back in 2018, after we got acquired by Bain Capital and Silversmith Partners. And as you can imagine and appreciate, with PE money comes um, the expectation of growth uh, and to grow faster. Um, and we started to notice at around about the same time that it was becoming ineloquent to service a growing base of clients and EU-based clients from across the pond. Uh, more so that there, were, there was a lot more demand coming out of uh, Europe, specifically London, 
And so, you know, it was inevitable that we were going to make a move into market. Um, our primary, you know, stance was really to try and service the clients uh, and then get on the ground and then start to diversify revenues and, and build out the revenues. So 2018 really was about formulating the business plan, putting together a five-year performer, getting, uh, getting sign off. We actually planned to be in market in 2019. Um, 2019 was actually quite volatile. Uh, we got buy off from the board and um, we kind of put the brakes on a little bit because Brexit gave us a little bit of pause. And so what we did was we started to focus on more of the administrative sides of building out the business entity, incorporation, setting up bank accounts, looking for office space, et cetera. While we had already done our research that, you know, Brexit or the implications coming out of Brexit, the direct implications wouldn't necessarily impact our business and be too volatile. We weren't quite sure of what the economical or commercial ramifications were going to be. Um, but after some time, it soon became apparent that those kind of economical ramifications would be so long tail that it would be no, no, um, uh, it wouldn't be worth our while to kind of wait and, and see how things panned out. So we decided to make a move. And in 220, we arrived in the UK, uh, started to put our plan into action. We signed a 12 month lease, hired our first person, um, and we couldn't have picked a worse time because two months later, our luck, COVID hit, uh, and our plan pretty much got squashed. Um, so we were forced to pivot off plan. Uh, it would have been so easy for us to just head, you know, we've only been back in market for two months. It would have been easy for us to head across the pond, um, settle back into US life and wait and sit everything out. Um, but we knew that there was substance behind our plan and we knew it was still worthwhile to, to carry on with what we embarked on. So uh, we reverted to take a bit more of a conservative approach to the plan. And as the market started to, so we cut back on spending, we postponed any hires. Uh, as the market started to open up towards the mid of the year, really sorry, I thought I'd turn notifications off if you can hear them coming through. I did turn them off. Um, bad, I haven't done my housekeeping properly. Um, so towards the, tail, uh, the middle of the year, we started to hire again, the market started to open up. And what became apparent was that COVID actually presented a few other new opportunities that we might never have gotten. Uh, so, you know, being, being able to be nimble, pivot off plan and capitalize on some of the opportunities made it a bit more worthwhile. Thanks, Seth. Some interesting insights. And yeah, I think between Brexit and the pandemic, you, you certainly picked a challenging year, but it's, it's good to hear that you know, you made it as successful as you, you physically could do. And I think it, you know, points to the benefits of ha having a plan, but being able to pivot when that plan doesn't go according to plan. Um, but you'll always remember that year for sure. And um, kind of back to you, um, I think so many fintechs want to be physically in, in both US and UK markets. What, what is so attractive about that dynamic? Yeah, so... You know, there's, there's quite a few aspects. I think if you look at the statistical side of things, um, you know, the UK and the US are the banking capitals of the world. Uh, they're also rated, um, you know, at the top of the fintech hubs of the world, specifically London and New York are ranked number one and, and number three, respectively, on the global financial index. Um, when you look at some of the other stats, you know, the, U, the US has 22 cities and the UK has three cities in that uh, fi fintech index. And while there's a lot of these um, smaller fintech cities that are bubbling up, you know, three of them uh, fast growing in India, none of them can compare with the investment and the infrastructure that's already been born out and, and built out from uh, London and New York. You know, we've heard a bit about the investments from both uh, Alexandra and Camilla. Uh, and, you know, when we speak about investments, the plethora of VCs coming out of these two cities alone uh, who are on the lookout for adding to their fintech stack um, are second to none. You know, Onbi, for example, uh, the company I work for, we have just undergone our second acquisition uh, of being purchased, that is. Um, and to put things into perspective, you know, fintech investment in the US in 220 was just shy of about $10 billion. Uh, and in the, U the UK it was about $2.3 billion. And that's about 3x larger than the third largest fintech city on that uh, fintech index. London specifically, when we're looking at that, you know, is the global uh, home of fintech accelerate as well, which makes it an even more attractive place to uh, to set up shop. There are, of course, other aspects 
uh, from when, from within the industry uh, with related to you know settling into the US and UK markets that can't be ignored. Some of the things that we were kind of looking at when when coming into market, you know, uh, the com- the country's infrastructure, or the or the the city's infrastructure, in, insofar as uh, smartphone and internet penetration is concerned, for people to be able to adopt uh, some of the new tech that's coming out and to use the tech. Um, the total addressable market can't be ignored. I mean, the US having a, a market size of 330 million people, the UK being the doorstep to the rest of Europe. Um, and then I know it seems relatively trivial, but there are smaller, softer aspects such as language, which makes it a lot more appealing when settling into the UK or, or the US, as an example. At least it was for us. Um, you know, when looking at where you make your next move, sometimes um, eliminating some of the complexities associated with getting into different markets um, makes makes the decision a lot easier, right? So when we, I'll give you some context, when we looked at um, the different markets that were available to us to, to set up shop, the Netherlands, Malta, Latvia, and so forth, um, the UK was pretty much a no-brainer because we were able to quickly and easily navigate some of the reg uh, legal and tax infrastructures in our own language that we shared with with the states uh, that just allowed us to plug and play. Perfect, thanks, Seb. Yeah, and I think that the language thing is really powerful, and also cult- culturally. I think I know there's there are some differences between Brits and Americans, but actually there's a lot of similarities in terms of cultural outlooks and, and humor and all that kind of stuff, which kind of Absolutely. you know you talk about the soft infrastructure. It makes it that launch a lot easier. Um, but yeah, really interesting to hear on B's story. Um, if we kind of start looking towards the, the future a little bit, um, Camilla, a question for yourself. Um, so the prominent and well-known VC firm, Anderson Horowitz, are, are famed for, for recently saying soon, every company will be a FinTech company. Um, what's your interpretation of that statement and, and how much of that is, is true, do you think? I mean, I, I can't argue with them, right? But no, it's, it's a really valid statement. But what I, I don't think Angela Strange was referring to every company being flooded with millennials in their fintech uniform, Patagonia vest, talking about their new startup, right? What I think she was trying to get at is the adoption of the as a service model for fintech, offering uh, companies a new method to service their customers, uh, retain their customers and increase their profit margins. So she gave examples of the like of Uber or Lyft, right? And their banking offer for their drivers, um, Shopify for the e-commerce, or like we talked about big tech earlier, Apple and their credit card. Uh, much needs to get done to drive financial inclusion. Uh, and FinTech has you know, proven time and time again to be a key contributor in offering financial products that are cheaper, uh, easier to use, and just better for the consumers. Uh, Angela mentioned, you know, there must be so many ideas that have fallen to the side due to prohibitive upfront costs. And similar to the development of AWS, there really could be this new wave of as a service to reduce the market entry barriers for the new players. And what the result of that would be is a twofold, right? There will be an increase of new entrants to the fintech entrepreneurs in the market. And there will also be large incumbents that are being able to build fintech-like solutions with significantly less barriers and costs involved. Uh, so what my take really is, and the takeaway that I kind of suggest is, I think every company will need to be thinking about incorporating financial services to their model, right? It's either through a fintech partnerships or it will be building it themselves. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's, I won't, won't argue with that at all. I agree completely with that. Um, and just touching on, on your reference to, to kind of fintechs building, creating partnerships and, and what that future might look like. I think that, that leads really nicely on to, to talking about a, a really big area in the sector where there's a lot of um, p- possibility and a lot of development. Um, so Alex, one, one area that has been getting a lot of attention recently is, in, is embedded finance. And I know um, through your work at, at Rise, created by Barclays, you've done quite a lot of thought leadership pieces on this area. Um, how can fintechs use this to shape innovation Um, and what do you think the next generation can do um, in the US Um, so so, sorry how how can fintech use use this to shape innovation and what can the next generation of consumers in the US expect as part of embedded finance and, and this new technology offering 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and like you said, I've definitely done a lot of um, work on this topic um, over the past few months. So it's one where I'm always like, how can I make it like as concise when I talk about it as possible? Um, I think if you look at the standard just definition of embedded finance, and I think Camilla really hit on a lot of these oh, a few of these points is it's really about the seamless integration of financial products into new and existing applications. And there's really two parts of it. You know, the first is there's these fintech companies kind of creating the new fintech and financial infrastructure. Um, you hear the term, I think, banking stack all the time. Um, I previously worked for two years in a in the finance group within Barclays, and I like to think of it as fintech companies rebuilding the processes and internal functions of a bank. Um, sometimes these are a kind of quote quote unquote the back office and middle office functions, but it's really rebuilding all of those layers that an, an allow a large financial institution um, to you know, engage with customers and to really operate in the background. So that's really where the FinTech infrastructure, um, banking as a service, banking as a stack kind of buzzwords really fit into this embedded finance piece. Um, and I think what's really exciting about it beyond the fact um, that you're taking some of these um, you know, in kind of labor heavy, also just process heavy roles and automating them, which um, I think for FinTech kind of being able to move beyond just creating the next neobank, but actually really diving into like KYC allows for these FinTech companies to go to market faster, but then to also um, offer different types of financial products and services um, to customers that were previously um, not able to gain those financial um, you know, products and services. So that really touches on that financial inclusion piece that Camilla noted. Um, I think then embedded finance moves to being all about the customer. It's really about that seamless customer journey. And I think that's where you're seeing adoption, not just across financial institutions, but really across big tech um, and consumer brands. I mean, if you look at embedded finance and you're thinking about a Lyft or an Uber, they want to keep their customers in their application for five seconds, 10 seconds longer, because that means that they have you, um, they can kind of retain you. And that's where customer acquisition costs and customer retention metrics come in. But I think that's where they want to keep you as part of like the Uber family or, you know, whatever company's family and um, product journey as much as possible. And that's where embedded finance uh, really lives with those kinds of brands. I think there's really exciting applications that people don't necessarily think about when they think of FinTech. So one that I think was kind of buzzworthy and exciting and maybe put some of some FinTech companies in the forefront of people who maybe aren't necessarily in the sector was the Square and Title um, acquisition. So $300 million um, acquisition by um, Square of Title, you know, Jay-Z's um, Jay kind of big music um, Line. And so, you know, people who avid music, music listeners, which I would hope are a majority of people, I can, you know, probably say that it's a majority of people now have, you know, Square popping up in their headlines. And it's like, oh, wait, you know, FinTech, like how music, FinTech, like where does, where do these two things live? And I think that's where the beauty of embedded finance is because it's also kind of bringing forward some of these FinTech and underlying um, financial products that are really driving all of these customer products and are really also enabling um, artists and enabling new markets, new kind of small, medium enterprises and markets to have access to financial products. So I always like to say it's like they view the artists as like entrepreneurs. Um, it's almost like the next banking as a service. It's like X as an entrepreneur. Um, but they're really seeing, um, you know, these artists and these content creators and these new kind of economies as entrepreneurs and are creating financial products that are tailored to them, which is something that you have been normally seeing when you think about your standard checking or savings account. So I think that's really exciting for the customers. Um, and then just one more example, which I think is super relevant to everything going on with, over the past year with the pandemic is applications across healthcare. Um, so we had a company at Rise that focuses on machine learning as a service. Um, they primarily worked with large financial institutions to embed these machine learning products into um, you know, financial products and just the kind of underlying technology that the bank uses but they found a really interesting use case in the healthcare industry where they were able to help with the drug discovery process, which ultimately allowed 
to go to market for new drugs to, to um, kind of increase or the timeline to decrease. And that's something where when you're thinking about the pandemic, when you're thinking about kind of the back to normal um, timeline, and you're also just thinking about these FinTech applications across sectors, that's one that you can really see the impact. And I think it's really exciting. Brilliant, thank you, Alex. Um, um, really excited and pleased that we got a reference to Jay-Z in this session. I think that's really cool. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, fine. So, so just rounding off the, the main um, panel, um, I think we, we'll take a look at some kind of specific advice to, to founders. So Seb, as a, as a final question to you, um, in our audience, we've got early stage fintech companies, we have founders from, from tech companies who are, you know, maybe looking to grow their businesses. I think having done it successfully at Ombi, what, what is your advice for, for scaling internationally? Um, and what are the perhaps the, the common growing pains that they might need to, to look out for if that is an objective for themselves? Yeah, I kind of feel like I have to start with saying I've got 99 problems, but, uh, uh, you know, Alex teed that up quite nicely for me. Um, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a handful of things, of course, that we can talk about, but uh, and loads of learnings that we've had by, by getting into market. And I'll kind of give probably you know, a handful of them, maybe five or so. So... You know, scaling internationally, of course, is a great way for you to diversify your revenues. Uh, let's be honest, you're not looking at expanding so that you can see the world. Um, having an international presence um, is another, you know, in another jurisdiction, not only allows you to diversify those revenues, but it allows you to boost your EBITDA multiple. Um, at the end of the day, there is an end game, like with any company. Um, and as mentioned before, you know, in these fintech cities like London and New York, there are you know, loads of venture capitalists looking at, um, you know, where they're going to get their new unicorn from. Um, and so, you know, one of the things here is you can use a good strategic partner to help you grow um, by being in these markets. The second thing here is, um, for the most part, you're likely going to be a little bit more of a later entrant into the market. Um, and you may have some catching up to do. So it's a tough slug to get into the market with set revenue targets in your first year, hit the ground running uh, and expect to build you know, significant revenues in here. Remember, you need to consider you know, branding, your supply and network, your infrastructure, marketing, uh, all those kind of things that will help you with your lead generation. So I would say you know, the advice here from a scale perspective is get boots on the ground, have a salesperson pre-sell um, the solution, um, so that you can understand what the market nuances are as it relates to the product and service. And then you can sculpt your market entry strategy once you're ready. Um, you know, you'll be able to make adjustments uh, and then you'll have a little bit more confidence that your product and service is fit for purpose for when you do enter into the market. Closely related um, is just because it works in one market doesn't mean it's going to work in all the other markets. So you've made the decision to get into market. You've, uh, you know, put down the investment Somebody mentioned customer centricity. I think it was both Alexandra and Camilla. You know, be more customer centric, spending time in the market, doing some research, getting the data analysis. The beauty about having that salesperson on the ground is that they can do all this reconnaissance on behalf of your brand. So rather than making sales your first KPI of the year, perhaps it's a good idea to make, uh, you know, data gathering that KPI um, for the first year. Um, and then don't be afraid to kind of, mold the product and service so that it's fit for purpose for the market that you're in, entering into so that um, you, know, it, um, you, you can sell that solution effectively. You know, for us, for example, we knew that we could sell our base product all day long. Once we were in market, we soon, we soon realized there were certain nuances either related to the regulatory landscape that we hadn't quite cottoned onto, that we had to change the product to make that a little bit more adaptable and versatile. Um, Another tip here is, you know, um, as Mike Tyson always says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, and looking back at our journey, my goodness, did we get sucker punched in the face? We had no idea. You know, we had the best laid plans. Um, the prospect of building a healthy business, you know, the the uh, the prospect of first year revenues even looked phenomenal until it was not. Uh, COVID hit, and our plan pretty much went straight out the window, like I mentioned beforehand. Um, while I'm sure a massive macro event like this will likely not happen anytime soon, touch on wood, um, 
you know, things don't always pan out. Uh, not in our personal lives, not in our working lives. And I think here, you know, in order to be able to succeed, you have to be able to bend in both. Um, and then the final thing here, Adam, I would say is, um, you know, find a great partner that can help you make that journey more seamless. Um, one that could take a lot of the heavy lifting off you in terms of the admin stuff, think of tax, think of regulatory, think of HR structure, uh, one that can, lo that can navigate local complexities of the market um, pre, during and post your expansion. Uh, it'll save you a lot of time, it'll save you a lot of money. Uh, when we kicked off our journey, our private equity um, owner put us in touch with one of their uh, portfolio partners who had just undergone their own expansion. Uh, and they were telling us all about their horror stories of getting into market. Um, you know, it even took them about a year before they could even get a bank account open. And so their plans were kind of offset by the fact that things dragged out until they found a partner. And that partner actually happened to be Zedra, uh, who they um, connected us to. And so we've been using Zedra for the last couple of years. And, you know, I've got to say, having a partner like Zedra alongside, right alongside us has been instrumental in helping us, you know, navigate some of these local um, tax, regulatory, legal um, hurdles that we've overcome over, or that we've um, encountered over the last few years. Not to say the least, it's kind of cut down on some of our SGNA investment in our first couple of years. Thank you, Seb. And some, I think some really valuable and, and, and wise words for anyone that wants to to kind of follow in a similar similar trajectory. So yeah, it's, it's really great. Thank you. Um, so we've got a little bit, before we jump into the Q&A, we've got a little bit of time just to, to do a little um, quick fire round. Um, so this is a little bit of fun. It's some predictions that our panelists have for the future and um, some quick kind of short answers. Um, so we'll do a couple of these and then we will answer some of the questions that have been coming up during um, the session. Um, so heading to Camilla first, um, Camilla, what cities or emerging hubs do you think offer the best future opportunities for fintech? I'm wearing my DIT hat. Anyway, don't be kidding. Um, the, the DIT has that crown, right? They've been able to bring together industry, regulators, and government to lay out the framework for fintechs to thrive. Uh, and they don't just accept, you know, things where they are, right? In an ambition to uh, maintain its leadership position for fintech, uh, Ron Khalifa was commissioned to set out a list of recommendations aimed at advancing the fintech landscape. It's really showing this proactive approach to setting a fintech-friendly ecosystem to further develop the industry and market and continue breeding fintech unicorns. So the UK, no, there's no doubt about it. Loving that optimism and positivity. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely take that as a as someone that lives in London. I'm, I'm great. I'm very grateful to hear that. So thank you. Um, and Alex, over to you. I think everyone's talking about the this mass exodus of, of people from big urban cities, this shift to, to remote working, to, to online working. Do you think any of that generally puts New York's title of, of home to fintech under threat? Yes, it's an interesting question. I, before I even dive into this, I want to say I love the pop culture references we've got going on this morning. Um, who said fintech wasn't fun um, <laughs> is, is completely wrong. Um, I think in terms of New York, I've always been a big proponent of New York. I think it's still the center, center of financial services and it will still remain a competitive location whether it's for top talent or investment. Um, yes, I do think you're seeing more cities crop up as locations where um, you have more um, fintech companies, investment firms, but I don't think the in-person model is completely dead yet. I mean, I wish my background was off um, and I wasn't having the Rise New York logo, but I'm actually in the office right now and I come in about three days a week. Sometimes it surprises people to tell them that, but I, you know, in terms of the level of engagement and interactions that I have with the companies that are back on site, the companies that are looking to come back on site, um, there still is a demand to be in person and you're still going to need those locations and hubs to do that. And I think New York is still in a perfectly you know, good position to do it. Um, and I think New York is very resilient. So whatever that hybrid model looks like, we'll have a, a solution for it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and Camilla, back to you, actually. Um, there's been a lot of talk about, obviously, the US and the UK and, and investment in today's session. 
Um, in 10 years time though, do you think Europe will get to a point where it overtakes the US in terms of investment and VC funding it secures? Um, look, <laughs> the capital pools in the US are significant, right? They place first globally. Um, in contrast, Europe plays third globally. It has a long way to go before it can even compete with that of the US. I'll leave it there. Um, but in an optimistic note, which I like to put that little sticker on, what we will see is increased capital flows from US investors into Europe, right? To tap into the high growth of the fintech industry there. Lovely, perfect, thank you. Um, and then Seb, over to you. Um, where do you think Onbi will be in five years time? I mean, we've, you know, we've just, uh, like I said, merged uh, as two successful US businesses. And so it's all about growth for us. Um, I think when, if I look at specifically Europe, um, you know, we're growing the UK market. I wouldn't be surprised within the next uh, five years that we'll have satellite offices across the continent um, to some extent. Uh, and, you know, it's likely, again, that there will be a series of uh, more M&A that will follow. Uh, we will likely buy some, we'll probably be bought out. Uh, potentially even float on the market, who knows? And then we'll just wait for Elon Musk to tweet something uh, and wait for our share price to skyrocket. <laughs> Bold predictions, <laughs> I like it. Perfect. <laughs> um, and Alex, final quick fire question to you. Um, what's like the newest areas of fintech that you're seeing that really excites you? Yeah, um, we definitely talked about you know, the fintech infrastructure 2.0. Um, wave. And I think that one is one that you see more and more companies creating different solutions um, around. Um, one area that I particularly am, you know, focusing on, I think, is only growing in terms of popularity. I think you're seeing a lot of early, very early stage companies starting to develop solutions is the climate and the green fintech space. Um, I think both based off of the administration in the U.S. and trends from Europe and just an overall kind of societal shift and kind of culture change. I think there's, you know, we've talked about climate um, initiatives in the past, but I think now you're really starting to see um, more money put into startups and more solutions that are customer focused and are really focused on, you know, how do you equate climate action and finances, which are two very, you know, you know, finance is something that's kind of in everybody's life. So how do you kind of use that as a platform to enable that climate action? And that's where I think, you know, FinTech really has a big opportunity. That's great, thank you. Um, so now we'll, we'll take it to the audience. We've had quite a few questions come in whilst um, the panelists have been um, given, providing their insights and thoughts. Um, so I think dealing with some of these questions. Um, so the first one is, is to you, um, Seb. Um, and it's, would you still consider Britain the go-to country post-Brexit? If not, which country would you consider most suitable to, to quote, plug and play? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, if I'll answer it in this way. If we were sitting back in the States in our office in Chicago and we're still faced with the opportunity to make a move across the pond, uh, for me, I would still say that the UK, uh, London specifically, would be my go-to. Uh, there are definitely some new places that have, that have popped, when I say new places, some, some growing places that offer, of course, really good benefits like the tax, tax cuts and what have you. There's Ireland, the Netherlands is, is booming, of course. But, you know, like I said, you just cannot rival the infrastructure that's already been put in place in the UK, specifically London. Uh, and so I would, um, doing it all again, I, I'd, I'd make the same decision. Great, thank you. Ooh, I love that answer. <laughs> Makes my job so much easier. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm definitely New York based, so sometimes I let my UK colleagues speak um, to the UK um, ecosystem even more. But I think, you know, sitting in the US and seeing the initiatives coming out of the UK to promote fintechs, staying there, growing there. I think between like the FinTech Pledge and the Clefairy, there's so many initiatives that are government-led, you know, financial institutions-led, um, just like kind of community-led that are all connecting and allowing to, allowing that ecosystem to kind of continue to flourish. 
so that fintechs really do stay in London. And I, I think that they've done a really great job, whereas sometimes I think the U.S. market's still a bit fragmented in that front. I'll maybe just add on to that. I, I fully agree. You know, there's this it's existing infrastructure, right? The entire financial services industry in New York and, and London are continuously competing for first place as fi the financial services capital. Yes. You know, that can just be picked up and moved anywhere, right? So that existing ecosystem, the support from government, uh, the support from regulators having only to deal uh, with the FCA for most fintech activity, maybe Bank of England, if you're doing something a bit more traditional, whatever it might be. Um, but the fact that you it's it's so, you know, the market entry barriers are so much lower, the, the industry is there, the ecosystem is friendly, it's very much collaboration first, relationships first. Um, and then there's industry groups like Innovate Finance that are lobbying on behalf of the industry. Uh, you have City of London on behalf of all financial services. It's just not, you know, you can't take that and put it in Berlin, right? So, but, I mean, I, this is music to my ears, but fully agree with all the points <laughs> mentioned. And I, and I fully agree that the UK will be a no brainer for companies that are expanding abroad. Yeah, the, the other interesting thing, and you mentioned the FCA just a minute ago there, Camilla, is, you know, they're actually setting the blueprint uh, or what's serving as a blueprint for other markets to copy in terms of, you know, their fintech, their fintech um, and the establishment across um, across a wide range of that infrastructure. So again, like you said, you know, it can't be rivaled at the minute. Uh, New York or the, the States and, and um, the UK are kind of competing for first position. Alex, you, you said it perfect, which is, um, you know, there's just so much infrastructure that's already been laid that, you know, it'll take a lot of time before the others kind of catch up um, so it just makes sense that, you know, these are the two key markets to, to settle into. Yeah. And there was one thing you mentioned earlier, Seb, where it's something that I think is overlooked or kind of forgotten, but it's that language piece. And when you said that, I was like, you know what, you're, you're so right. There is such a big challenge if, some, if a company is trying to set up in France or the Netherlands, and then they're trying to expand to Europe and to the UK, sorry, and then to... The U.S. like the ability to just sit and communicate that much easier, and I think that just is an added benefit as well. And it's something that you know yeah. is very hard to just reproduce or uh, change. Absolutely. Brilliant. Okay, and we've had another one come in actually. So, I'd, um, feel free to we can all kind of go around and everyone can say their piece, so there can be a volunteer on this one. Um, but the question is, in the era of digitalization. Companies have access to an unmatched amount of data. What importance do you believe fintech companies should be putting on data quality issues? I don't know if anyone wants to take that one first. Yeah, I can take a, I can take a stab at this one. Um, I think with data, data is obviously, especially data related to financial services and people's personal financial data, it's one of the stickiest pieces. And because of that, there's so much regulation and initiatives that are led by the government that give companies access to this data. And so I think in terms of data quality, yes, there will likely, you know, there will be questions around data quality and how do you take different pieces of unstructured data and make sure that you're applying the right models to it to best do customers so that you're not taking advantage of them. I think that will always be a question, but I think because in the UK, particularly um, in, the U in Europe, there, you know, open banking initiatives are led by the government, there is that extra regulation. But also when you look at the US, financial institutions are the most regulated industry alongside probably healthcare by far. And so rather if you compare kind of big tech, which is now getting so much scrutiny in terms of customer data and how they're using it, I think financial institutions have so many limits already in place that fintechs are being held to the same standards or are trying to, trying to adapt to the same standards that large financial institutions would have around that data so that they can scale correctly. And so I think being in such a regulated industry, yes, there will always be some kind of question around like the quality and how you're really applying that to consumers. But I think the government aspect and regulatory piece really supports with making sure fintechs at whatever stage they are have those considerations in the back of their mind. Great answer, excellent answer. And we just actually had one, one final question just come in whilst you were talking actually. And this might be a little bit unfair and it's difficult to answer, I think. 
Seb, um, talking about regulation between the US and UK, is there one of those landscapes from a, a regulatory perspective that's easier? Are they the same? Are they vastly different? What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, that is a very tricky question. Um, I mean, Alexandra, you're probably not going to like me for this one, but I would have to say it's slightly easier um, in the UK, simply because when you're looking at the regulatory side of things, you know, you've got to comply with um, regulations and so forth set out by the individual states in the states, right? Whereas in the, in the UK, you've got one governing law um, that you've got to comply with. And I'm not saying that that's in, that's um, I'm not saying that's a piece of cake either, but it just makes it a lot more simpler when you're not having to consider 50, 52 other states. Um, I think I got the number right, uh, and their um, and their complexities when coming to when it comes to fintech, right? So if you take Onbi for example, when we're looking at payments and being able to facilitate corporate payments on behalf of businesses, we've got to take into consideration all the different laws related to. Uh, multiple states, although we, you know, we are governed primarily by the state of Delaware. Um, there's still, you know, how I'm not sure. I'm not sure if everybody understands the law of escheatment, but just to kind of put into perspective, after a period of time, you've got to escheat funds back to the government if funds remain unused on corporate funded payment cards, uh, and that varies by the individual states. Uh, there's constant lobbying going on on behalf of the individual states, which kind of changes. Um, the scope of how you've got to uh, deal with payments across um, across one single country. So, you know, the long, the, the short um, answer to that is, I think uh, it's an easier place in the UK to navigate compared to the UK, uh, to the US. And if I can maybe just add a comment to that as well, not only to deal with state regulators, but to deal with federal regulators where it's applicable and sometimes they have you know, this gray area and competing. So even though you have clarity from one, you might not have clarity from the other. Um, whereas in the UK, you know, they've taken on with the FCA primarily this project innovate this competition mandate where companies are able to really work alongside the regulators to deal with the gray areas that, that are part of um, anything with do with financial services. So agreed with Alex's point, it's a very highly regulated industry, one of the highest, but there's new ways either through the advisory unit, through uh, their sandbox program, uh, tech sprints, and, and all um, to really help companies get authorized. They very much come talk to us, um, which may not be the same. I know some regulators in the US, they do, they have their innovation hubs and whatever, so I can't say poorly about them, but in comparison, it's you're comparing oranges to oranges to apples, and more so ever, uh, or moreover, since that's the way they say it in the US. Um, you know, the, the FCA is and has led the, the GFIN, the Global Financial Innovation Network uh, initiative, right? That partners with regulators globally to help companies and to build more harmonization. So they have this global sandbox of sorts. So companies, you know, being regulated in the UK, then have could have access in theory, if they're approved, to work in the sandbox in another country, right? And, and they're continuing to build throughout all of this. So it's it's, again, you're comparing apples and oranges in this space. Yeah, and to add to that, and maybe a little bit related more so to our previous conversation around just um, the exodus of towns and urban centers, because the U.S. market, um, in terms of re regulation and how where fintech companies set up shop, it's yes, maybe cause you know now in this digital environment, yes, maybe companies are moving to Austin or Denver, but it's still Austin or Denver. It's not every single city across the US and you're having kind of um, different companies popping up there. So you're still seeing these hubs where there's, you know, FinTech startup talent that are aggregating, maybe not necessarily New York or San Francisco, but coming from those places and still having regular kind of cross transatlantic, um, you know, connections and touch points. So I think that kind of goes back to that question about exodus from cities and it, I think that regulatory piece really fits in there too, because they're still kind of forcing companies to create in these like hubs and create these hubs for themselves. Fantastic, thank you. I think we'll have to leave it there. There's, there's some other questions that we can follow up on offline, but just given timings, we'd, we'd have to stop, unfortunately. Um, but it's been a really interesting session and covered a range of topics, a great assessment on where FinTech is at the moment. 
some of those emerging trends, um, embedded finance, we've talked about M&As, references to SPACs, the UK from all the time to, to set up overseas. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, everybody. I wanted to, to say a, a huge thank you to our, our wonderful panellists today, who I'm sure you'll all agree provided some fantastic insights on the, the shape of things to come. Um, as I mentioned, we've got some other questions that we'll be following up on in due course. And I would really encourage the audience to extend the conversation Alex and Seb. And um, between them, there's a, there's a huge well. Um, and also to the audience today, thanks for dialing in from New York, London and beyond. Um, we look forward to, to seeing you for the remainder of our US tour. And hopefully we can do a, a physical event when we get back to, to normality um, at some point in the future. But um, for me and everyone else, thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure and, and stay safe and we'll see you soon.